So we briefly spent some time yesterday on guided media. Where we, actually before we got to guided media, we spoke about this, the electromagnetic spectrum that we have available for communication signals and some characteristics and some examples of communication systems and what range of frequencies they use. And then we got to a very quick overview of three examples of guided media. Today we'll just recap on those three. We're not going to spend much time on them. We're going to move on to wireless. Just use these three as examples. So the first two examples were twisted pair and, and coaxial cable. And both of them involve sending electrical signals across some conducting material. So in generally, for such guided media, the, the wiring is designed in such a way to re reduce the effect of interference. With twisted pair, the pairs of wires are twisted about each other. That's one way to reduce the impact of interference. With coaxial cable, there's two conductors. There's an inner conductor and an outer conductor. And again, the fact that they're on the same axis, they're one inside the other, they reduce the, the signals we send across them can reduce the interference on other transmissions. So the design of the, the layout of the wiring is to, to limit that interference and to limit the pickup of interference from others. Why do we want to limit interference? Who tells us that more interference gives us a, more interference gives us a lower data rate? Who told us that? Daddy. Not me. Before me, Shannon. Shannon's equation. If you remember the Shannon capacity equation, it's got bandwidth in it. Of course, more bandwidth, more data rate. But it's also, it's also got signal to noise ratio. The more noise, the lower the... So if noise is larger, SNR is lower. And therefore, capacity is lower. More noise, lower capacity. Well, the interference from the perspective of our signal is noise. So the more interference, the more noise, the lower the capacity. So. That's why we want to keep the interference low so that we can get a higher capacity. In practice, twisted pair is the most common of the two. Twisted pair in telephone networks, LANs, uh, very, very cheap, very easy to install. If you need to put some cables you can through the, the, the ducts and through the cavities in the walls, it's very easy just to feed the cables and they'll bend as necessary. Some other cabling, and in particular for twisted pair, what's called unshielded twisted pair is what we see. It doesn't have any special shielding on it. Shielded twisted pair adds an extra protective layer to stop the interference. So with shielded twisted pair, there's less interference, less noise, therefore a higher possible data rate. But the problem with shielded twisted pair is it doesn't bend so well. And it's a little bit more expensive, so it's not so common. Uh, that is, if you want to feed it through the cavities in the wall, it's very hard to make it bend at the right location. So shielding improves the, the speed at which we can send our data, but sometimes it has some other costs, some financial cost or some cost of ease of use or convenience. There are many different types of the cabling, depending upon the usually the thickness and the quality, the thickness of the wires and the, the quality of the, the coating, different categories. We'll see some numbers or some typical data rates that we achieve uh, in a moment. Coaxial cable mainly in uh, audio systems or hi-fi systems to connect components together nowadays. Uh, cable TV, so the cable coming from the wall to your TV if you've got a subscription to cable TV, TV is usually coaxial cable. And in, in the past, some long distance communications, like between cities, but it, mainly that's been replaced with optical fibre. So with optical fibre, we send not electrical signals, but we send light. 
So we have a light source that creates some uh, light that reflects or refracts, is it right? Re reflects across the some thin fiber of usually glass or plastic. And it, the light's received at the other end point, which is uh, uh, used to, to indicate the data being sent. In terms of practical use, optical fiber is uh, much more expensive compared to twisted pair and even coaxial cable. It's much harder to deal with. You have very thin glass or plastic fibers. Yesterday, I showed you a, tw a, a land cable, twisted pair, and I showed you uh, cut up into pieces. Okay? It would be quite easy for you to put it back together because you just get the copper wires and attach them to the right end point. You could just wrap them around each other and you could still send a signal if you connect them back together. Not much fun, but you could do it. With, with optical fiber, if you cut the fiber, you, you essentially break the glass or plastic fibers and you need special devices to join them to, together, like special devices which are quite expensive. You can't just go and buy one. So in fact, the idea of installing optical fiber is usually not something that uh, anyone can do by themselves. In a small location you could, but it, to install across, the, um, across a building, for example, or across a campus, usually is much more expensive because of the, the equipment needed. Optical fiber is used in long distance communications, so mainly if you think across cities, between cities, between countries. But also used inside some uh, local area networks, inside some buildings when a very high data rate is needed. Maybe in a data center for, um, for say, Google or, or, or Dropbox that has to connect many servers together and they need to transfer data at a high data rate, then optical fiber make, makes sense there. When we transmit a signal, we know that the signal power gets weaker across distance. How much weaker? One thing depends upon the material being used that the signal is being transmitted across. And it also depends upon uh, the frequencies used. Generally, the amount of signal that we lose across distance is much smaller with optical fiber compared to the electrical alternatives twisted pair. Uh, so we can send further with optical fiber. The bandwidth available, and it's captured, although not so well to see, but on this one, the bandwidth available for optical fiber, even though this line is smaller, it's approximately 10 to the power of 15, which is what? Uh, around 100 terahertz is the bandwidth, 100 or 1,000 terahertz, whereas twisted pair is only 100 megahertz. So it's about a million times larger bandwidth available. It depends upon the particular uh, systems. Much larger bandwidth with optical fiber, coaxial cable, a little bit larger than twisted pair, well, about 10 times larger. So twisted pair up to about 100 megahertz, the bandwidth available, coaxial cable up to about 1 gigahertz and optical fiber uh, what 1000 or 100 terahertz larger bandwidth both the Shannon and Nyquist capacity equations tell us larger bandwidth larger capacity larger data rate much higher bandwidth available so usually a single fiber we can carry the same amount of data per second as tens or hundreds of electrical cables. So you want to connect uh, or carry data from one city to another, a single fiber can be used to replace many old uh, electrical cables. As a result, small size, lightweight. And that becomes important when you need uh, um, many connections, where there's a lot of data to, to to transfer, say, between cities and across countries. So when you have a large amount of data to send, 
it becomes lower or a lower cost to install. To install just inside, say, but from my computer to another computer using optical fiber will be quite expensive because the amount of data that we need to send is quite small. But when we've got the amount of data that, say, Bangkok sends to Singapore, a large amount of data to send using optical fiber will be cheaper to install than using hundreds of electrical cables. The electrical cables get interference from other electrical sources. So my LAN cable can be interfered by the power cable on the computer and other sources. That's not the case with optical fiber. So the interference from other sources is not so significant, which is a good thing. It's isolated from other sources. So that's about all we want to say about these three examples of guided media. The last few, or then we'll summarize and compare some numbers. Electrical cables in the order of gigabits per second data rates. It's not fixed at one gigabit per second, but uh, that's the ranging from lower to, to maybe several gigabits per second, tens of maybe. Twisted pair, the distance is usually limited to uh, a maximum of several kilometers. So if you want to connect our campus here at Bunker D to Rungsit, distance of about 15 kilometers. <coughs> then you can't just run one long twisted pair cable under the ground if we even had a duct to run it through because we would not be able to transmit that required distance. What we would need is to have repeaters along the way. Transmit across the first two kilometers from one device to another, maybe two kilometers from here, and then have a special device that receives, like a computer, receives and then transmits again. These repeating devices are costly. Whereas if we used optical fiber, maximum distance is in the order of tens of kilometers, say 40 kilometers, it differs in some cases which we could connect via just a single cable between the two campuses. It makes significant impact when you want to cover a large distance. For example, across an ocean, across the Pacific Ocean from uh, Asia, Tokyo, for example, to the west coast of the US, where thousands of kilometers, then having to have a repeater every two kilometers becomes very expensive. Having one every 40 kilometers is possible, or better. So electrical cables, if you only have a small amount of data, or your data rates required are in the order of gigabits per second, then they're the cheapest. But when you want to start to send the data of many users, like a whole city of users, that's when optical fiber becomes more, uh, more cost effective. The last few slides we will not look at, but just I'll pick out a couple of values just for reference, no need to even understand them, but this summarizes the range of frequencies we have available. Twist of pair it differs depending upon what, um, what type is used. Coaxial cable up to about half a gigahertz. Optical fiber 100 plus terahertz, so the bandwidth is much larger. The other things you see, and we may make sense of them later, are repeater spacing, so how far can we send with a single cable before we need a device to take the signal and send it again. The longer the better, yeah, the larger the better. Typical delay is like this, the propagation delay. We've normally assumed that the speed to send a signal is the speed of light, 300 million meters per second. But it depends upon the actual material. And you can check the calculations, but five microseconds per kilometer is, I think, about 200 million meters per second. Speed of light is 300 million meters per second. Five microseconds per kilometer is about 200 million meters per second, saying that 
with most of these technologies, we cannot send our signal at the speed of light. It's slightly less, about two-thirds. It varies sometimes. Attenuation is how much signal strength do we lose across distance. We transmit a signal at some power level. As it travels distance, it gets weaker. By how much? This gives some typical values. For example, uh, coaxial cable, 7 dB per kilometer. Remember dB indicates a ratio. 7 dB is what? A factor of... It's, can someone calculate? 7 dB? 7 dB equals 10, log base 10 of the, our factor, our ratio. Therefore, it's a factor of what? 5? About 5. Which means that we transmit our signal after 1 kilometer, the signal will be 5 times weaker. That's what it means there. After the next kilometer, it will reduce by another factor of 5 and keep reducing. So the larger the attenuation, the more it reduces, the signal reduces. So coaxial cable is very high attenuation here. Twisted pair is, is much lower. And optical fiber lower again. Yep. A larger attenuation means that the signal gets weaker faster. Okay? We started a signal with some strength, say a strength of 100. And over a distance of one kilometer, with an with a attenuation of 7 dB, if it starts at 100, after one kilometer, it will be five times smaller. If it starts at 100, it will go down to 20, the signal strength, five times smaller. Over the next kilometer, it will go from 20 down to, what, four, five times weaker. Five, because 7 dB, converted back to a ratio is just a, is a factor of five. So if you're, what, point, point 0.2 dB, what is point 0.2 dB as a ratio? Calculator. Someone who has a calculator. 0 0.2 dB, 10 to the power of point zero zero two. Ten to the power of point zero zero two. Let's try it on the calculator. Sorry. One zero. The attenuation is zero point two dB, which is equivalent to ten to the power of what? Zero point zero two. Remember it's ten log. So we divide by 10 first. 0.2 divided by 10 is 0 0.02 is 1.05. So it's just larger than 1. That is, every kilometer, if we start at a signal of 100, after 1 kilometer, it will be 1.05 times smaller. Which is about... So if we start at a signal power of 100, after one kilometer, it will be down to about 95. But at an attenuation of 7 dB, if we start at 100, after one kilometer, it will be down to 20. The signal strength gets much, much weaker, faster. Right, the larger this attenuation, the weaker the signal will be across a fixed distance. That is, the attenuation through optical fiber is very, very small, which means it doesn't get weak across distance as much as the others.
we will, when we look at wireless, we will show some ways to do calculations of the attenuation. How much, how to get these numbers. With wireless, it's a little bit simpler than the, the different materials because with wireless, the material is what? Air. But with optical fiber, the material that our signal travels through is different than coaxial cable, so we need to know about the materials. But in air, we can have a good approximation of how much signal do we lose. Again, the point is not to remember or know these values, just, just be aware that when we choose wired technologies, we care about the bandwidth available, the range of frequencies, the larger the bandwidth, the larger the data rate we can achieve. We care about attenuation, because attenuation will impact upon distance, usually, and other factors. We want to be able to send further in many cases, especially if we want to build a large network across a, a country or between countries. And delay, well, usually they're about the same. It's a little bit less than the speed of light. Let's not look at those plots. Questions on guided media before we look at unguided. So let's look at unguided and wireless transmission, really, and look at the, some of the characteristics of transmitting signals through the air. And we'll spend a bit more time on this. We'll talk about the concepts first, because there are a number of theoretical concepts we need to explain, and then we'll talk about, just quickly, some examples of wireless media. There are many different types of wireless communication systems. You use at least two, probably on a daily basis. You use Wi-Fi and your mobile phone. So two different wireless communication systems. But there are others. Some you, you know about, infrared for your remote control, Bluetooth. Uh, but there are many other systems, satellite access for satellite internet, TV, uh, terrestrial TV and a few others we'll mention. For all the wireless systems that we'll talk about, we can look at them in a general perspective. And this model tries to capture what a wireless system looks like. It's common for t TV transmission, for satellite internet access, for Wi-Fi, and many other systems. We have a transmitter and a receiver. And with wireless transmission, we send some radio signal, some radio waves between the transmitter and receiver. And the, the way that we do that is that, so instead of sending an electrical signal through a copper conductor or sending light through some fibers, we send uh, some radio waves. And to do that, we use antennas. And the simplest view of an antenna is that it takes some electrical input and produces some radio wave as an output. And that wave propagates through the air and the receive antenna receives that and converts it back to an electrical output, which is our, contains our data we're trying to communicate. So we need to look a bit about, well, what, what are the characteristics of antennas? We're not going to study how antennas work but we want to at least get to, well, what are the main characteristics when you buy an antenna? What do you look for? And then we'll look at, in this topic, how far can we separate the receive and transmit antenna such that they can still communicate? Like our wireless access point on the wall, if you walk away with your laptop or phone, at what distance away from the access point will you stop being able to communicate with it? What's the range of communications? So 
So we'll look at some ways to, to calculate that under some ideal conditions. So today let's start with antennas. An antenna takes some electrical current as input, the transmit antenna, and produces some electromagnetic waves as output, and opposite at the receiver antenna, where those waves range from around 3 kilohertz up to about 300 gigahertz. Other frequencies larger than 300 gigahertz we uh, normally cannot transmit. And it's the ra this range of frequencies is often called the RF or the radio frequency. So sometimes I'll say radio waves. It's just the name of that range of frequencies. A transmit antenna and a receive antenna, if they're the same, uh, same characteristics, that is if they're the same shape and size, same design, then they operate in exactly the same manner. So often we do not distinguish between how a transmit antenna and a receive antenna operates. We just talk generally about any antenna. So normally you buy an antenna, you can use it for both, transmit or receive. You don't buy a transmit antenna and then buy a separate device which is uh, receive. They can do both. Now, when we send our signal out from the transmit antenna, it needs to go, we want it to go to the receive antenna so it can receive the signal. So we're going to care about the direction at which the signal propagates. Which direction does it go from the, the transmitter? And how far it propagates, the distance. Are the two main things we care about. And they depend upon the shape of the antenna and other things, but the, the design of the antenna impact on, on that. So we'll look at some examples and talk about some typical designs of antennas. Uh, examples that you no have seen, you see the, the Wi-Fi access point. These antennas are the, it's called dipoles, the most common you'll see around. It's called a dipole. Uh, it comes off here. It unscrews. Very simple. Just a, a straight up antenna. Okay, there's just some uh, material in there. So think of the antenna as just a, what, a, a 10 or 15 centimeter stick. We have two on this device. We, we could do it with just one. Okay. What other types of antennas have you seen? What do antennas look like? See if we have some pictures. I'm sure you've seen many, many different types of antennas. Okay, maybe on TV if, to pick up terrestrial home, uh, yeah, terrestrial ground wave um, TV, not satellite TV. You can have these antennas that just sit on the top. Also dipole antennas, the same as these, but just bigger. Okay. Usually there's two. Sometimes if you look, um, these towers for wireless transmission, I think this one is, for example, for transmitting uh, over a long distance, say between two towns, or, or to create a link between cities across a large distance. So there's big towers, and these are antennas on those towers. Uh, this one has others. Other towers, and I don't think I have a picture, if you see, you'll see many around the mobile phone towers. You'll see them around and on top are they either antennas like this or sometimes more often they're a rectangular, long rectangular shape if you look closely. Just different types and shapes of antennas. Here's one for s communicating. I think this was to some deep, deep space uh, objects. Mars observatory or the Mars rover and so on. 
What's the shape of this antenna? What do we call it? Dish, good one. And the dish, the shape of the dish? Not a donut. We'll see a donut later. A bowl, a para, paraba, parabola, parabolic antenna. Sometimes we, we talk about it. Think of it, it's a circle. Well, it's not quite a, a, a circle. It's got that dish shape. A parabolic antenna that we'll talk about. Many antennas have that shape. Not necessarily that big. Here's one of the biggest, I think, the biggest antenna in the world. The biggest parabolic antenna. It's 300 metres across. Okay. So it's built into the ground to, to, to collect uh, signals from space. Uh, see this thing hanging at the top? What happens, and we'll see a picture of it later, that this transmits the signal down to here and the shape of this parabolic antenna, the dish, is such that it transmits down and it reflects off and a single small signal comes down here and one large signal reflects off. That's how it's shaped that way to achieve this effect of really amplifying the signal. The larger the dish we'll see, the larger it will amplify the signal. We'll talk about the gain of the antenna. A dish or parabolic antenna, but used for home access. So if you get one of the popular ones is IP Star. Some of the, the schools and, and government offices, some homes have them for internet access here. It's about half a metre, but the same dish-shaped antenna. Do I have any others? This is, I think this one was a UHF antenna for UHF TV. Remember we mentioned ultra high frequency yesterday. It's just for different channels for TV. We usually use different shaped antennas. That's all I have. Where is the donut? We don't normally see donut antennas. We talk about, and we'll see a picture of a donut later, is the shape of the signal that comes out of the antenna. That's what we want to explain. So in general, we can talk about different types of antennas. And the first one we'll introduce is called the isotropic antenna. Let's say my, my hand is an isotropic antenna. This is the isotropic antenna. It transmits a signal. Which direction does the signal go? With an isotropic antenna, the signal goes in all directions with equal strength. That's what an isotropic antenna is. We have the source, the transmitter, the antenna, and it goes forward at the same strength as backward and the same as up and down. Remember, we have three dimensions. So an isotropic antenna propagates power, so transmits and the power of the signal transmitted is equal in all directions from the source. So if you can think of the shape of the power spreading out from the signal spreading out from the antenna, you can draw it as some sphere, some spherical pattern. It gets, the signal gets weaker across distance, but with an isotropic antenna it gets weaker at the same rate in all directions. Our donut antenna is next. Omnidirectional is another general type of antenna, and these dipoles are generally considered omnidirectional. If you look at the antenna, the signal propagates in one plane about the antenna in the same strength. So when we transmit with an omnidirectional antenna, if we hold it this way, the signal going forward, going back to the left and to the right, goes at the same strength. That is, one meter in this direction from the antenna, if we measure the signal, it will be the same strength as one meter to the left, one meter to the behind, and one meter to the right. But 
If we measure one meter up, the signal will be much weaker than one meter on this plane. So the signal power is, is directed to go on one plane, so think of the, the, the horizontal plane, in the same strength in each direction, but on the other plane, on the vertical plane, going up and down, it's much weaker. So if you could draw a picture of that, that's where it looks like a donut. It's round around the, the horizontal plane, but up and down it doesn't go uh, the same shape as a sphere. So you think of a sphere and you squeeze the, the top and the bottom, you'll get a donut. We'll see some different pictures of that as, as we go through. So that's another common type of uh, antenna. The power is propagated in all directions on just one of the planes. We have two planes in 3D. We have the horizontal plane and the vertical plane. What azimuth and elevation are other names we'll see. With isotropic, in all directions it goes equally. And we talk about, more generally, a directional antenna is one that concentrates power in a particular direction, more so than the others. Like the, and I've, like the pictures I showed of the parabolic antenna, don't worry about the details of this, but remember the parabolic antenna, the picture I showed, we have some source device, it transmits a signal to the dish and the dish propagates the signal back all in this one direction. The signal does not go behind the dish or at least it's much weaker in that direction. So a directional antenna concentrates the signal in one particular direction. And we'll talk about how they compare and how much they concentrate the signal and we'll use gain to do that. It's hard for me to draw them in 3D, but try and imagine isotropic as a sphere. That is, take your isotropic antenna, let's say it transmits with a power of 10 watts. Okay, that's the transmit power. What the antenna does is the signal propagates, it starts at 10 watts. As it goes in this direction, it gets weaker. And let's say we measure the strength one meter away, and it's five watts. If it's reduced from 10 down to five across one meter. Then with an isotropic antenna, if we measure one meter above, one meter below, one meter in any direction away from the antenna, it will be five watts. That is, the signal will reduce at the same amount in all directions. Whereas with an omnidirectional antenna, if we transmit, say, at 10 watts, and we measure on the horizontal plane this way, one meter away, and let's say it's uh, seven watts, and one meter here is seven watts, so all around it will be the same signal strength one meter away. But if you measure one meter above it, it may be just two watts, much weaker. The signal is weaker one meter above and below. The signal is propagated in one plane only. And generally a directional antenna, think is the antenna concentrates the signal in one particular direction. So one meter away from a directional antenna, say in front of me, if I transmit at 10 watts, maybe it's 8 watts, one meter away. But behind me, it's 0 0.5 watts. It's very weak behind me, but very strong in the direction at which I uh, transmit, well, depending on the shape of the antenna. The design of the antenna will impact upon how much directionality it has. How much is the power concentrated into a particular direction? And when you buy antennas, one of the characteristics that you look for is how much 
uh, is the signal concentrated in one direction and that's measured by antenna gain. So we need to try and look at antenna gain. Uh, yes? Yes, these, this router, the antennas, those dipole antennas are an omnidirectional antennas. So in fact it does matter as to the, the orientation of the antenna. So generally you think if it's straight up like this and like the one on the wall, then think if in a coming out across the ceiling the signal will be the same strength in that direction as this direction, but going down it will be weaker across the same distance and going up it will be weaker. That's ignoring, interfe ignoring interference and, and obstructions like the ceiling and the wall. Now how much weaker? It depends upon the antenna design. We'll see some plots or some information about that. Let's try and first explain antenna gain and then we'll come back to some examples of different types of antennas and see uh, how do we characterize how much stronger or weaker the signal is in a particular direction. If you go forward a few pages you'll see there's another handout I included at this time. Very simple picture. If you in your lecture notes you have a page with Four, four, four pictures, this is one of them. Just a quick example. You go to this one. And I'll try and draw it on the screen. It won't be as nice, but you'll, you'll follow along. just so we can add a few other notes to it. So this, you've got the, the handout with just four pictures on it. We'll go through those four, uh, but I'll try and create them as we go and explain what they show. So we start, let's say the idea is we have some antenna. This is the location of the antenna. And these pictures, we only have two dimensions. I cannot draw 3D on a piece of paper. So you can imagine that we're, you need to try and imagine in 3D, but we can only draw in 2D. But I think you'll be able to um, make sense of it as we go. With an isotropic antenna, the signal propagates in all directions with the s same strength. So if we measure at a point, let's say this is a distance of one meter, just as an example, one meter away from the source, we transmit, and I'm just going to switch back to the one you see, we transmit at a power denoted as PT. We know that as the signal propagates, it will get weaker it attenuates. So PR, the received power, is always going to be less than PT. But by how much? Well, it depends upon the shape of the antenna. So I'm just going to try, try and draw that picture and to explain what it looks like, why it looks like that. So we have PT, the transmit power. Let's say I measure one meter away the signal strength and I measure it to be some power level PR. Let's give them some values. So in the slide, the picture you have, we, I think we don't have values, but let's just make up some values so you can also make sense of that. Um, what can we use? And the values that I put uh, may not be realistic but they're just simple numbers. Let's say PT is 
10 watts. Okay. We transmit it with a power of 10 watts. And then one meter away, we measure the, the receive power. And let's say we measure it to be um, 2 watts. If this is an isotropic antenna, it doesn't matter what direction from the source that we measure, any point one meter away, if we measure, it will be also 2 watts. Okay, One meter in each direction, anywhere from the, the source, If they're all one meter away, you measure and you'll always get it to be two watts. Because the signal disperses in all directions equally, and that's why in the, the picture you see, we have a circle to illustrate that, okay, I cannot draw a circle as good as on the computer, but say we have a circle that at any point on that circle, one meter away from the transmitter, we receive some signal and we measure that, it will be two watts in our example. That's if we use an isotropic antenna. But in fact, we should also draw the, the other plane, so coming out in 3D. Now, in general, with a directional antenna, the signal is concentrated in a particular direction. Think you take this circle and squeeze it. Then one part may come out here and it will get smaller at this point. And that's what this tries to draw. The blue one here tries to draw the fact or the, the received power at particular points with a directional antenna. So now we use a different type of antenna. Same transmit power, but change the antenna, some directional antenna. Let's try and draw it. So let's say on top of this we have another antenna. Ours is blue, is it? Same location, a blue antenna, but it's directional. So, and say the direction is in this direction, it's going to be stronger than the opposite direction, and that's what the, the, the picture that you have in front of you shows. What this blue line shows is that, okay, with our first example, the isotropic antenna, we transmit at 10 watts. It shows the points at which we receive at 2 watts. What this blue line shows is that if we use a direction, directional antenna, at what points, at what locations, would we receive with a power which is also 2 watts? That is, it shows that at this point, if we measure the received power from our directional antenna, it will be 2 watts. And same at this point. And at all of these points along the blue line, it's indicating if we measure the power, it will be 2 watts, using our example. Can I draw that? So the shape is it's smaller back here, and it may be not the same, but yours is better on the, the picture. The blue one says that at this point, 
If we measure the power, it will be 2 watts. And at this point, it will be 2 watts. And at all points along that blue line, assume it's 2 watts. Whereas uh, the black line, it's 2 watts if we use an isotropic antenna. Why 2 watts? I just made up that number. But the point is, it's the same power along the line. Why is that? Well, a directional antenna concentrates the energy in one direction. That means if our directional antenna is pointing this direction, the energy goes in this direction and it will go further using the same amount of power. Let's say the distance was it went twice as far. Uh, not so relevant, but let's say now we measure the distance between the antenna and this furthest point away. And let's say that distance is uh, two meters. So with the isotropic antenna, one meter away we got two watts, but with the directional antennas, the best case is that two meters away we get the same amount of power, two watts. So we've concentrated the power in a particular direction, allows, allowing us to send further and receive the same amount of power. Now, in the opposite direction, how far can we transmit a signal such that we receive it 2 watts? Well, it's less than 1 meter, maybe 40 centimeters or whatever the value is here. So with a directional antenna, the energy goes in one direction, but the opposite direction or the other direction, it's much weaker. Now, the next point. Focus right at this point. That is, one meter away with isotropic, we got two watts. We transmit with 10 watts. Using an isotropic antenna, one meter away, we measure two watts. If we measure using our directional antenna at this red point, what will the power be? Some power level at point X. Not the exact value, but relating to the transmit power and the other numbers, what do you think the, the red point power level would be? We know we transmit at 10 watts. We know that the signal gets weaker as it travels some distance. So any received power is always going to be less than the transmit power. So the red point is going to be less than 10 watts. But we know at this point, two meters away, the power is two watts. So the red point, well, it's going to be greater than two watts and less than 10 watts. I don't know, we don't know the value yet, but it's going to be less than the transmit power. It must be. If we're some point away from the transmitter, it's going to be weaker. But we know it's going to be greater than 2 watts because we already know if we keep going in that same direction, a little bit further, we get to 2 watts. So it's somewhere in between 10 and 2 watts. Now, let's put a number to it. So we don't know the number, but let's say it was... Uh, six watts just to make up a value let's say we did measure at this point one meter away from the transmit antenna and it's six watts why six? because I made it up 
It's a number less than 10 and greater than 2. Okay? We would need to measure it. So imagine we have a real device, we have a transmitter, and we have a device to re measure this receive power, and it turns out to be 6. This example is not about the specific values. We'll see what it's about right now. It's about the ratio between the values. So now, if I use my isotropic antenna, my original isotropic antenna, and I measure at this red point, what's the receive power? With the isotropic antenna, transmit at 10 watts, receive at 2 watts at this red point. But now if I change antennas and use my directional antenna, I transmit at 10 watts, and at that same point, let's say I receive at 6 watts. How much better is my directional antenna? We can say that Let's make some space. With the isotropic antenna, one metre away, we measured it to be two watts, the receive power. With my directional antenna, one metre away, let's say we measure it to be six watts, in the best direction. That is, that's the strongest direction. We can say the directional antenna has a power level three times stronger than the isotropic antenna. That is, the gain of our directional antenna is 6 watts divided by 2 watts, a factor of 3. focusing just on that direction, that particular direction, measure with isotropic antenna, we get a power level of 2 watts. Measure with our directional antenna, we get 6 watts at the exact same location. Therefore, we can say the gain of my directional antenna relative to an isotropic antenna is a factor of 3. It's 3 times stronger. Someone can convert that to dB for me. 3 equals what? 10 times log base 10 of 3. People are busy drawing maybe. 3 is our gain. So 10 times log of 3, 4.77. So I can say my gain of the directional antenna equals 4.77 dB relative to an isotropic antenna. And here we use a new notation. My, our directional antenna is 4.77 dB greater than the isotropic antenna. And in fact, when we talk about antennas, we normally measure the strength relative to this isotropic. And therefore, we write, instead of saying 4.77 dB relative to an isotropic, we write 4.77 dB I. Where the I refers to an isotropic antenna. And this is an, an important characteristic of antennas. When you look at real antennas, you go and buy one, the main property that you'll see advertised is the gain of that antenna, measured in dBi. And it tells you, in, in the best direction, 
how much stronger the signal will be compared to an isotropic antenna. The reason we compare it to an isotropic antenna is because it's our, uh, well, it's the reference point. It's that perfect antenna that just sends the signal in all directions the same. Any questions? So the values are not so important. 6 or 2 watts, because the gain is a ratio, if it was 12 and 4 watts, it would be the same gain. It's still a ratio of 3. If it was 600 milliwatts and 200 milliwatts, we still get the same ratio. Why was it 6 watts? Why did I choose 6? Well, I just chose a number between 2 and, and 10 to give an example gain. In, when you buy an antenna, it usually specifies what is the value of the gain. So antennas are measured relative to this isotropic antenna. And in fact, there is no such thing as an isotropic antenna. You can't build one. They're just a theoretic, that is, in practice, you cannot build a perfect isotropic antenna. You can get close, but uh, the gain, the signal spreads a little bit in different directions. But real antennas are measured relative to an isotropic antenna. Let's add a, a little bit more explanation. What about in the opposite direction for our directional antenna? We transmit it at 10 watts. What is the value here? It's 2 watts. Remember, the idea is that the blue, blue line, at every point on the blue line, the received signal would be 2 watts. So this would be 2. What is the value at this point for our blue directional antenna? If we transmit at 10 watts, at this point, it's 2 watts. So as we go further, it's going to be less than 2 watts. We don't know the exact value, but it's, we know it's going to be less than 2 watts. Let's say we measure it and it's uh, half a watt. So for our isotropic antenna, one meter away, we measure, we get 2 watts. With our directional antenna, one meter away, we measure and we get half a watt. Calculate the gain of the directional antenna in this direction. In a different direction, we measured the isotropic to be 2 watts and the directional to be half a watt. Find the gain. The gain relative to isotropic, half a watt divided by 2 watts, is a quarter, 0 0.25 dBi. That is, we're saying that if I use my directional antenna and we look at the opposite direction, the bad case, the signal will be one quarter the strength of, of as if I used an isotropic antenna. It's smaller than what we would get if we used isotropic. So the gain is less than one it's actually a loss in that case. Minus 6 dB. When we log, we'll get a negative minus 6 dB I. 
relative to an isotropic antenna, my gain is minus 6 dB. It's actually a loss of 6 dB. It's 6 dB weaker than the isotropic. And if we look at other directions, we'd get different values. That is, the blue one, you can see in this direction it's going to be strong, with a high gain, but going the opposite direction, there's a weak or a low gain, a loss in this case. And in other directions, the gain is going to be different. So it depends upon the shape and the design of the antenna as to how the gain, or what is the gain relative to isotropic at different locations from that antenna. And you see plots like this that show the antenna pattern, where it's strongest and weakest. Normally, when you buy an antenna, you care about the strongest point. Okay, that is the first one. We don't normally care about this. Because if we point it in the right direction, if we orient the antenna correctly, then we will use the strongest, our receiver will be in the strongest direction. So we care about the strongest point. So when you buy an antenna, it's usually this value which is listed. The, the gain relative to isotropic in the strongest direction. I said for a directional antenna, I mean it's for any antenna, any real antenna. Omnidirectional is also directional compared to isotropic. Think of isotropic as a reference antenna, the perfect antenna that sends a signal equally in all directions. Every other antenna can be compared to that isotropic antenna. And we can compare it in terms of the gain. Questions? Mm. Correct. The, the gain in different directions will be different. It depends upon the, the shape of the antenna. Right. The same as when I talk to you, if I didn't have the microphone, it would be easier to hear me if you're in front of me compared to behind me because my signal is going in this direction. Okay. It's not propagating at the same strength, or it doesn't come out in the same strength in the reverse direction. Or well, there because of different reasons. Again? Yes, in this case, if we want to transmit a further distance, we need an antenna with a higher gain. Because with the same amount of input power, we'll be able to go further. If the gain was, in the, our example, we had a factor of three. If it was a factor of four, it would mean that it would be four times larger than the isotropic antenna one meter away, which means we could get further away to get to two watts. So for the same transmit power, and at the same receive power, the larger the gain, the, f the further the distance between the transmit and receiver, the further we can send, with other conditions being the same. Uh, the Look at our example. Same transmit power, both antennas. Both we transmitted at 10 watts. With a particular receive power, in this example, 2 watts, if we want to get a receive power which is the same, then the higher the gain, the further away from the antenna we would be able to receive at 2 watts. With our isotropic antenna, we, have to, we are 1 meter away when we receive at 2 watts. With my directional antenna, I was 2 meters away when I receive at 2 watts. If I had a higher gain, then maybe I could be five meters away and still receive it two watts. The higher gain will effectively lose less power over the same distance. Mm. 
in the last five minutes, I'll just show you some examples of different antennas and, and the gain values. Where? Not this one. So I think we've covered that. The gain in the absolute value is the, the signals re received at some point when using our, our directional antenna versus what would be the power received if we use an isotropic antenna. So Px is the power received using our blue antenna. At that same point, what power would we receive if we used our isotropic antenna, Pr, the gain is the ratio of them. And of course we can convert to dB. Let's just look at a couple of websites that list I'll go direct to some pictures. Cisco is a company that builds networking equipment and they sell some Wi-Fi antennas. They not, may not be the, the best or the most recent, but they have nice specs. So this is the antenna. Uh, that is, the website has some good information. What's happened? Maybe not. Hang on, maybe my browser has crashed. Uh, hard to, there it goes. Something crashed. Let's bring this one back up. Try and zoom in. This is just the specs of a particular antenna. One of these dipole antennas, you can buy one. And we scroll through. One of the characteristics is the gain. This dipole antenna has a gain of 2.2 dBi, which means in the strongest direction, and with a dipole, the strongest direction is, should be the same in the one plane. In the strongest direction, it's 2.2 dBi larger than if we used isotropic. And you see these plots here try to capture like we drew, but in two, two planes, two, the azimuth and elevation, the horizontal and, and vertical plane. That is, in the same direction around it, the power will be the same. But up and down, the power will be strong at this level, it will be weaker up and weaker down. That's what this second blue diagram tries to capture. You don't need to understand them, but there are plots that show in which direction is the signal strongest, strongest and where is it the weakest. Scroll down to, right, this is just a different dipole antenna. Let's find some others. This is uh, an antenna that you can say place on the wall, on the ceiling, different shape, it's no longer just a stick. It has a gain of 5 dBi. It's called a sector antenna. Look at the, this plot here. This focuses the, the signal in a particular direction. So it's strong in this direction, but weak in this direction. And it's different going up and down. Okay, and the, vertical plane and a gain of 5 dBi which means if you orient it in the right right way such that your receiver is uh, in this direction the signal re received will be stronger than if you use the other antennas we have others some ceiling mount and omnidirectional antenna 5 dBi so just a bigger antenna than these stick antennas. A mast mount, so one you can, uh, again, bigger that you can stick on a, a stick outside. A different wall mount antenna, again, one of these sort of square antennas you can stick on the wall. And it concentrates slightly different than the others. So you can buy an antenna, depending upon what area you want to cover, you choose an antenna to fit. 
The others are just get stronger, I think. Here's 10 dBi. Okay. Concentrates a lot in one direction and it spreads out a little bit in other directions. Twelve dBi. You see these start to get strange shapes because the way the antenna is designed, so you think of going up and down, the signal's strong all around, but up and down can be quite weak. And just keep giving different shapes. See, It's like trying to concentrate the signal in one direction. It goes in one direction, but it also goes a little bit in other directions. And I think we just get different shapes and different... Now we get to a dish antenna. Parabolic dish. It's highly directional. A gain of 21 dBi. You can think the energy is really squeezed into one particular direction. Much higher gain, but if your receiver is not in the right direction, you will not pick up the signal. And I think that's all the useful examples they have there. Next week we'll, we'll look at the attenuation and how much power we lose with signals. So we'll talk about antennas, then we'll talk about their power loss in wireless.